الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهن وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل على محمد وآله الطاهرين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد الرسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم تراهم رب تراهم ركعا سجدا يبتغون فضلا من الله ورضوانا سيماهم في وجوههم سيماهم في وجوههم من أثر السجود ذلك مثلهم في التوراة ومثلهم في الإنجيل صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وعلي محمد What better way to commence than in the name of the Most High, all knowledgeable, who is most worthy of worship, far removed from imperfections, without who nothing could come into existence. He who lives and is not created, وَهُوَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ بِيَدِهِ الْخَيْرِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ صلوات على محمد وعلي محمد In any discussion about religion, especially those that preach the existence of a God who serves at its, as its focal point to which all rituals and purposes of its adherence are directed, it would be foolish to try to understand the rites, rituals, and per peripheral beliefs without first understanding the one who serves at its center, i.e. the God. Many a times we are asked by those around us, in schools, at work, who is this God? That, who is this God that you believers keep speaking about? Where is He? What is He? How do you even know that He exists? As Muslims, we should have an answer to such questions, not only for the uh, person asking us, but for ourselves. For if we do not understand the basic principles of Tawheed, then all of our subsequent actions, right? Our prayers, 
our fasting, our transactions with our neighbors are all tainted, tainted by the fact that we have yet to realize the existence of the one to whom all of our actions are to be dedicated. Right, let us not think, brothers and sisters, that Allah is this being living far, somewhere far away at the other end of the universe or something, far removed from us. We are closer to you than your jugular vein. He's closer to us than our jugular vein. He's everywhere with us. He created us. He knows all about us. He is sustaining us. But alas, how heedless we are in response to Allah. Alhamdulillah, الذي أدعوه فيجيبني وإن كنت بطيئا حين يدعوني All praise is due to Allah upon whom I call and He responds even though I am slow in responding when He calls me Walhamdulillah, الذي أسأله فيعطيني وَإِن كُنْتُ بَخِيلًا حِينَ يَسْتَقْرِضُنِي And all praise is due to Allah, whom I ask, and He gives me, even though I am stingy when He asks me to give for His sake. We have our schools, families, friends, our businesses, hundreds of clients, 50 calls a day from big shots, looking for nothing more than to contrive methods of making money off of you. And all of these are good things, your family, your school, your job, are blessings from Allah. I'm not saying to become a hermit and live in seclusion just because you want to get closer to Allah doesn't, doesn't mean that you are to give up your responsibilities to work and provide for your family. قال الإمام الباقر عليه السلام من طلب الرزق في الدنيا استعفافا عن الناس وتوسيعا على أهله تعطفا على جاره لقي الله عز وجل يوم القيامة وجهه مثل القمر ليلة البدر. Imam Al Baqir, the fifth Imam, relates, it is he is narrated to have said, He who seeks sustenance in this world in order to be independent of people for his needs, to provide for his family members, and to stretch affection unto his neighbors will meet Allah the Almighty and Glorious on the Day of Judgment, while His face will be as bright as the full moon. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So let us not think that if we pursue high careers, that it means we will be compromising our faith. Rather, all Allah asks of us is that we don't make mo that money our goal. For let us look at all of those people who have been delusional, who have been made delusional by the very thought that money, power, and glamour bring happiness. No, rather they are the most depressed, those people, the most distressed. We find them engaging in what? Alcoholic, beverage consumption. Yet yeah, that escapism, escape from reality they want. Gambling, illicit sexual activities, thinking, what? thinking that these things will give them a lasting pleasure if they continually expose themselves to them. But rather, we find that these things bring nothing but temporary pleasures. Only for what? For the pleasures to wear off. And then we find that these individuals go back down into their depression, looking like wild animals for food, for the next thing that will stimulate their senses. Well, let me tell you something. Those things will never satisfy you and you will keep wanting more and more and it will never suffice until the day you die. مَثَلُ الدُّنْيَا مَثَلُ مَاءِ الْبَحْرِ كُلَّمَا شَرِبَ مِنْهُ الْعَطْشَانُ إِزْدَادَ عَطْشًا حَتَّى يَقْتُلَهُ Ma Musa ibn Ja'far has said, The likeness of this world is as the water of the sea. The salt water, right? However much a thirsty person drinks from it, his thirst increases so much until it kills him. You keep desiring more and more. You buy that car, when's the lease up? You buy that house, you're back looking at the market to see what the value is to see if you can sell it because it's too small. 
You get married, I can't stand this person. A thousand trips to the mall and you're just getting started. Until you are all of a sudden in a small wooden box surrounded by your family members standing over you and reciting prayers. So tell me, did you take that car with you? Did you take a single item of clothing that you just had to buy from the mall because it was just your size and color? How about that money that you spent those sleepless nights toiling for, thinking that if you kept amassing more and more that somehow you would buy your eternity? We'll take none of that with us. يَتْبَعُ الْمَيِّتْ فَيَرْجَعُ إِثْنَانِ وَيَبْقَى مَعَهُ وَاحِدٌ فيرجع اثنان ويبقى معه واحد يتبع أهله وماله فيرجع أهله وماله ويبقى عمله The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم related to us that when somebody leaves this world three friends follow him his family what do they do? They take you to your grave. They can pray for you. They can do some good deeds on your behalf. Other than that, what can they do? Nothing at all. What's the second friend that comes with you? Your money. Your money can what? Maybe pay some of your debts off. It buys you your grave. What else? Maybe it pays for somebody to go to Hajj for you if, God forbid, you miss the pilgrimage, right? What can it do for you? Can it pay off the angels to write, you know, good deeds for you? No, it can do nothing for you after that. There's one friend that goes with you in the grave when those other two abandon you. Not even your own family who you spent your whole entire life with stays with you necessarily on that night you die. They leave you. It gets dark and cold and scary in the cemetery. The very night you died, they leave you. They have to go back home to the warmth where they're not so scared. You've been with them your whole life and they leave you that very night you die. This is how it is. This is the reality. What goes with you and stays with you in the grave? Not your family, not your money. Your good deeds and your bad deeds, those go with you. And you're responsible for them. Your good deeds will help you. Your bad deeds will harm you. Why is it that we live on this earth, yet we don't realize this reality that everything will perish? Instead, we think we're here forever. We spend our lives as if there will be no accountability. Is life more precious than that? Is that why Allah says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa? I'm going to put an earth representative of mine. Why? So they can waste time? So they can only be born to satisfy their physical desires? Not caring if it's halal or haram means until what? They drop dead? Is life more precious than that? Has Allah withheld the secret maybe to happiness in something else instead of these material worldly goals? Well, it's not a secret. That's the problem. It's not a secret. Haven't we heard of something called Al-Quran? Haven't we come to realize that our Creator is the best one to go to in order to achieve happiness? وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we send down of the Quran that which is a healing and a mercy for the believers. But we think, no. God? What God? I know better than God. Because I have lots of money. I have children to make me happy. My music, I have that one. I need an escape from reality. I don't need Quran and these prayers and dua. This will bring me happiness and tranquility. Not some thousand year old book that has absolutely no relevance in my life today and is just boring. You know, they talk about their life. You know, that... The Quran doesn't have relevancy in my life. Music will bring happiness in my life. Your life? Your life? Where did you come from? You insignificant creature that at one instance didn't even exist. 
Where are you going when you depart this world? And where are you now? I can assure you, brothers and sisters, most of us are living in fantasy worlds that give us an escape from reality. Isn't that the power of drugs and alcohol on the mind? You can't face life, so you try to escape it, right? And what do you think music does? Same thing. Music takes you, puts you in a different realm, a realm where all of your lousy fantasies are being played out along with the lyrics, only for 20, 30, 60 years to pass and death comes and wakes you up and puts you in the reality. In whom illa kal an'am bal adallu sabila. They are like cattle. No, no, no. They're worse than cattle. They are more astray from the path. Why? Their whole lives, they're following what Hollywood tells them. Whatever Hollywood says is in style, they follow. Just long enough for that style and trend to change, and we keep going in a cycle. And we're zoned, we're so zoned into it, the system, and enamored by it, that what? We don't even realize it until maybe someone near to us dies, and we say, wow, we wake up. Or we're told by a doctor, you have three months to live. Or better yet, some of us never realize it until it's too late. Al-Hakumut Takathur. Abundance has diverted you. You're so stuck into the cyclical system of material, material, material. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Until you visit graves. So brothers and sisters, now we are brought back to the issue of recognizing the Lord around who our religion orbits, upon whom the argument of our religion rests. So how do we answer when others question us about the existence of Allah? How do we react when we watch science documentaries that tell us that this earth could exist without a God having had to create and sustain it? How do we respond when our teachers in school tell us that it is nature that decides how species will evolve? and adapt to their surroundings. If we can have basic answers to these questions, what have we been doing all of our lives? For what other reason do we exist in this life than to worship Allah? Only for us to not even be able to stand in the face of those that reject Him and to say with an intellectual and logical argument that yes, indeed, He does exist. I'll tell you why. So why? Why does Allah have to exist? Why couldn't things have just come spontaneously, as Stephen Hawking relates? Yes, one of the world's greatest astrophysicists puts forth the idea that there was an instance where there was no universe, right? Nothing existed, no matter, no space, no time, everything known to us in the physical world, right? Didn't exist, and therefore, right, no laws of physics, and then spontaneously, out of nowhere, the universe and all its laws came into existence. From what? From what? From themselves? Yes, I said it. Yeah, from themselves. That's how they created They created themselves, right? But I thought they didn't exist. How can something that doesn't exist create itself? How can they perform the action of creating themselves when they didn't even exist to be able to do so? The universe didn't exist, but it created itself. What? You don't believe me? Are you saying that it can't be, can't be so? That these PhD professors who attack the existence of God would ever say something so simplistic and illogical that, that even a kindergartner would say can't, can't happen? Page 8 in his book entitled The Grand Design where Stephen Hawking puts, puts forth his theory of creation called M-theory. He says, and I quote, We will discuss how M-theory may offer answers to the questions of creation. According to M-theory, ours is not the only universe. Instead, M-theory predicts that a great many universes, a great many universes were created out of nothing. Their creation does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, 
these multiple universes, and listen carefully to this, listen carefully, arise naturally from physical law. Wait a minute. I thought you said that a great many universes were created from nothing. Now you say that they arose from physical law. So then where did these laws come from? Was, first of all, was it nothing or was it physical law? And, and if it was physical law, where did these physical laws come from? Not only that, but to say such a thing would have to mean that these physical laws pre-existed time, matter, and space. But aren't laws only applicable when there are those things under which they are governed? Meaning, aren't laws only reflections of those things that they are said to work under the influence of? In other words, in order for there to be physical laws, there must be what? Physical things. But yet the law existed before the physical things existed. They're telling us that there existed something that was beyond the scope of time, matter, and space that created the universe. And you know what we say? You are absolutely right. Call him whatever you want. Names aren't important. You call him physical laws, we call him Allah. But don't go around mixing words and phrases in order to confuse people into thinking that you have came up with an alternative possibility to the existence of a God. You're just taking away the name God and giving him the name physical laws. Well, I say, Mr. Hawkins, thank you very much. For your M theory has proved further to support the existence of Allah by the very statement that you use trying to prove his non-existence. Don't be afraid, brother.